Hi, I'm Bart Herbison, Executive Director of the Nashville Songwriters Association. And this week, the story behind the song, one of my prized possessions, I have the handwritten lyrics on my wall upstairs. <laughs> So you're the biggest part of me. It's just one of the best love songs ever. And we're going to get into the incredible story behind that song in a minute with Ambrosia's David Pack. But before that, I'm loving this new project I'm looking at. It's called Napa Crossroads. It's music. It involves some of the top wineries. Read some of those names involved in this project. That is phenomenal oh, to thank me. You. David. Well, let's see. We got The Doors, Ray Manzarek, his last performance. Uh, he lived in Napa yeah, Valley. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, the great Bella Fleck, <laughs> Nashville's finest banjo picker in the world. Uh, Alan Parsons, my dear friend, mixed the first Ambrosia records. And uh, of course, a little record called Dark, Dark Side, Side of the, of the Moon. Moon. Yeah. <laughs> Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Uh, you've got Billy Dean, Jimmy Wayne, country, country's finest, uh, Larry Carlton on guitar, Doyle Dykes on guitar. You've got Cage the Elephants, Lincoln <laughs> Parrish. On guitar, Todd, this, uh, Todd Rundgren. Uh, so tell us about this. What is it? How do we get it? This is uh, available now on Amazon and iTunes, and it's at Whole Foods Markets and uh, Barnes and Noble. But uh, yeah, five years of my life, uh, I wrote all of it in Napa Valley, collaborating with some of the top wineries in the world: Silver Oak, CEO, Farniente, Pride Winery, Garjulo, Casa Piena. Uh, each winery, we collaborated on two songs, real stories of their lives, not not stories about getting drunk. I know some of you would like that, but I, I let my country friends stay with those songs. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the five wineries, uh, and then I wrote a song for Ray Manzarek, because he lived in Napa the last 10 years of his life. Turns out to be the last keyboard performance of his career. And phenomenal. it's a stellar, stellar performance. Well, I know some of the songs, and it is phenomenal. One more time, where can we get it? Amazon and iTunes, Whole Foods Market, Barnes & Noble. I just want the grapes. <laughs> Look at that cover of those grapes and those wineries. So we're with the incredible David Pack, and you're the biggest part of me. I usually do this at the end, but how many people have come up to you? We dated to that song. We got married to that. I fell in love to that song. It's got to happen almost weekly. Yeah, it's, it's hundreds, uh, if not... Well, a lot of people, but it, it's great when you've touched somebody's life in that way, you know, once in your, even once in your life. And it was my girlfriend's song and ours. Oh, with man, more, with, with dude. More, with more than one girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a, that's a double header. <laughs> one at a time, but anyway. Yeah. So I love the story behind this. You, uh, you really start off, Ambrosia's kind of a rock band. And you're opening for, I mean, you're not opening for soft rock acts. Right, <laughs> it's correct. For a while. Yeah, yeah, we were... People such as... Well, we opened for Fleetwood Mac, we opened for Rush. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I mean, Blue Oyster Cult, the Beach Boys, I mean, all, all kinds of different uh, different acts. But, but a few albums into Ambrosia's phenomenal career, it's part of American music history, some of the songs that you wrote changed the direction of the band. Your first charted single, that we're taping this during Tin Pan South 2014, it'll be out a few weeks later. You were on the CSAC show last night, you played these and everybody's singing every word. But your first charted, real charted song with Ambrosia is? Holding On To Yesterday. And uh, that was, uh, believe it or not, 1975, yeah. when you were only 12. <laughs> no, I, that's the year I graduated from high school. But um, Holding on to yesterday, which started as a country yodel. That's right. The bass player, Joe Puerto, came up with this kind of a hook. And then I kind of wrote a song around Joe's chorus and uh, played it for Herb Alpert. And he said, uh, I think you could go more R&B with it. Of course, he was right. He was right. Because he's Herb Alpert. Yeah. And uh, became our first top. And a lot of people don't know. They know Herb the musician, but A&M Records and just phenomenal right. music genius. And, and just before the song we're going to talk about today, you have your first number one. And it's a classic love song. Right. We have a song called How Much I Feel in 1978, uh, which seems to pop up now on the uh, Time Life love yeah. songs of the 80s and 70s. And uh, uh, How Much I Feel. Well, here we were, a progressive rock band, but I kind of wrote these uh, love ballads, um, I guess not unlike Phil Collins and Genesis, mm -hmm. having this progressive rock band, but here's Phil 
writing songs. Well, like, you know. songs mark the moments in our lives, and just before the song we're going to talk about today, you get involved with the hottest record label in the world at the time, and you're really involved with the hottest band. It was pretty cool. Warner Brothers Records, we uh, switched from 20th Century Fox to Warner Brothers, and they had everybody. Uh, they had Doobie Brothers and The Young Prince, and they had Van Halen, Madonna, and uh, the greatest A&R staff of Lenny Warnaker and Ted Templeman, Mo Austin, and those guys. They were just all uh, for the artist. They had it all together. It was. And you're out touring with the Doobie Brothers on the plane with the Doobie on the side of it. And we'll get back to the Doobie Brothers connection to this song in a minute. But you're about to go on a trip with the family, and I, I love how this song is born. And they're running a few minutes late. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Because <laughs> what happens next? It was. You're a, literally sitting in the car, I think, waiting it, for him to come out. It was the Fourth of July in 1979, and uh, waiting for my family to get in the car to go to a Fourth of July celebration in Malibu, and um, they were taking too long. And I realized I'd left all my gear on in the studio, so I run back to my separate studio building and uh, just sat down at the piano for some reason and the chords popped out and I kind of went uh oh where's the tape recorder and I turned on my reel to reel and uh, wrote the chords and the, the melody to biggest part of me literally five ten minutes and, and substantial portion of the lyrics substantial portion of the lyrics just kind of fell out and uh, turned off my machine heard the car horn honking they were waiting for me and then uh, shut the this door this is literally <laughs> 10, 15 minutes or less? Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. I, it just, it's one of those things you wait for all your life, but it, it seemed to just fall out. And So you quickly finish the song when you come back, as we know it today, but you second guess yourself a little bit. Yeah. And Michael McDonald, Doobie Brothers, right. hottest writer, artist on the planet, your buddy, you give him a phone call. Right. Yeah, we've been touring a lot together. We were writing for the first time together, and uh, I wasn't happy with the lyrics. So I went, actually played it for Mike at his home, and said, I wrote this song, and I don't like these lyrics, but the song is pretty cool. And Mike heard it and said, are you kidding me? Those, those, this is probably the reason the song's going to be a hit. And he goes, Because I've heard you give this advice to other songwriters. Sometimes you got to be careful not to overthink right. that moment of genius. For me, it was, I'm a perfectionist, so I, did, I thought they were too Holiday Inn sounding, too Hallmark card sounding lyrics. And <laughs> That's what's great about it. I said, Mike, this sounds like a band. I can imagine a band singing this in a Holiday Inn. And he goes, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, Mike was right, but I was wrong. I said, well, would you try taking a shot at the lyrics? And he said, sure. You know, and I didn't hear back from Mike for like four and a half months. Uh, and the record was mixed, released, entered the charts at 40 with a bullet, and I get a call from Michael McDonald at about 2 in the morning. And I'm like, hey, and he goes, hey, David, you know you know that song you're working on? I'm like, yeah, yeah, Mike, uh, uh, where are you? He goes, oh, I'm in Milwaukee or something. I got some lyric idea finally, you know, and he goes, well, well I go, what is it? He goes, well, uh, let's call the song The Heart. It's the weakest part of me. And I said, man, that's a great idea, but guess what, the single came out last week and it's already 40 with a bullet. <laughs> and he goes, see, I told you that was going to be it, the original lyrics. And that's, as our friend Paul Harvey would have said, the rest of that story. So it's, uh, it's really a part of our romantic music lexicon around the world. And that this week for the Tennessean and Tennessean.com is the story behind the song, the incredible David Pack, and you're the biggest part of me. You know, uh, one of the most memorable performances of Biggest Part of Me was President Clinton's first inauguration. I was a music director for the Arkansas Ball, the biggest of all the balls, pardon the expression, and uh, the Clintons were coming out to do their first presidential dance, and I sang this for them, and within the first few bars, uh, President Clinton spun around right in front of me and says, I goes, I, I love that song. <laughs> True story. So well, here's a little bit of that. Uh, right. Need you love here beside me. Need you close enough to guide me. From the fears that are inside of me, you're the biggest part of me. Well, make a wish, baby. Well, and I will make it come true. 